Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, COVID's Impact on Philanthropic Relationships. What can we learn from moving and moving forward? This program is part of a new joint project of JFN and Upstart called Granted, Stronger Relationships, Greater Impact, which we launched in March. In addition to organizing monthly programs such as this one and facilitating conversations, Granted offers a wide range of tools, articles, and case studies and other resources on our website. So please um, go check it out after this webinar at jgranted.org. Today we'll be able to hear an interactive discussion between two grant maker grant seeker pairs as they reflect on the ways that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted their relationships. We will, just, we will discuss how grant makers' philanthropic practices have changed from the start of the pandemic to the current day and what's to come. In particular, we'll focus on what lessons we've learned in the past year and what practices um, we can institute as a result of COVID as that we might want to make permanent. And with that, I'm very glad to introduce Jonathan Horowitz from the Klarman Foundation, who will moderate today's conversation. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. It is so great to be with all of you. Thank you, Tamar. Uh, Jonathan Horowitz here with the Klarman Foundation in the context of this conversation, also a very proud upstart board member. So really excited to kind of wear a couple hats in this conversation and super excited to be here with Alana Reske Kidd and John Adam Ross, two incredible Jewish social entrepreneurs who do deep, amazing work, and Joni Blinderman and Ayalon Eliach from two incredible Jewish foundations, Covenant Foundation of Littman Camphor Foundation for, Littman Torah, uh, for Living Torah. And uh, I will just say I had a chance to be with all four of you a few weeks ago, and everyone should Grab your water, get your notebook ready. You're not gonna wanna miss a minute of this. This is like very fun group of wise, joyful, hopeful people with a lot of just like deep wisdom to share. You're not gonna wanna miss any of this. And I do wanna express um, before we kind of dive in, just a little gratitude to the four of you because talking about relationships, talking about anything fraught these days is a little bit hard and a little sensitive, even privately. So certainly to do that in a fishbowl is not an easy thing. And this requires a lot of candor. And all four of you said that what was ma gonna matter to you the most in this conversation was that you could be authentic. And so just expressing that that's actually not an easy thing to do these days to in a webinar, in a fishbowl, be authentic and honest. So thank you. And I would say even like, especially thank you to Alana and John because there's more maybe at stake in terms of being a nonprofit leader in a conversation JFN hosts about, you know, with that honesty. So thank you, especially. Um, and I'm gonna borrow one thing I learned recently from Andy Hanauer, who runs the One America Movement, which is a great organization. Andy now starts complicated conversations by asking everyone to take a pause and inside their own head saying to themselves out loud, I am the smartest person in the room. I have nothing to learn from everyone and I am the most right. And I think if we say that out loud, right, everyone is smiling and laughing because it's just so absurd. And I just want to ask us all to sort of do that because it'll maybe kind of shake us out of our critical uh, mindsets and a little bit more in a deep listening and empathy mindset, which is probably what we need for this kind of a conversation about funder and nonprofit relationships. So like with that, I'm going to try to get out of the way and get the conversation going. Um, opening question that is really to all four of you. Uh, when you think about funder and nonprofit relationships, and that's often gets really flattened to the transaction of like grant making or gift making, like site visits, cumbersome reporting, but like get out of that because relationships are not the process of giving money. The relationship is the thing that happens the other 364 days in a year when we're actually in, in a relationship with each other. Like for you, what does a strong, equitable, good, healthy relationship look like between nonprofits and funders? Like, what does that actually look like and feel like for you all of the time, not just in that process of trying to get the money or give the money? Um, open to anyone who wants to jump in and start. Joni, why don't you kick us off? <laughs> I knew it. I was going to do it myself anyway, but then, okay, there you go. Um, I, I agree completely with uh, the, the way you sort of set out the question that there's all this transactional stuff that's going on um, around reporting, around the proposals, around the review, around the board meetings, et cetera. Um, but what's really important, uh, and, and some of that is, it is important, needs to happen. We have fiduciary responsibilities, et cetera. So we need to know what's happening and so on. We've 
you know, the, the issue of the sending in reports for us uh, become important for reflection for the grantee and for us to learn and have questions and so on, have that dialogue. What I think really is, and, and I learned this, I've been in philanthropy twice. I've spent half my time as a professional in philanthropy and half my time in the field. And I did it with big spreads in between. When I first entered philanthropy, honestly, I, I have people on my shoulders from Carnegie Corporation, from Rockefeller Brothers, from uh, the Revson Foundation um, deeply, um, who taught me the need to have deep respect, to start with deep respect around what people are thinking about and what they're doing in the field and to come at every conversation like that. And the thing that this morning when I was thinking about this a bit, I thought of that first conversation. I don't know if it's the first time I met you, John, um, but the first conversation we had with Harleen in her office, what are you thinking about? What are you dreaming about? And honestly, I'd never heard of process, you know, thing, right? As you're describing your whole process and that the end result of a, of a theater production or something isn't what it's all about. It's what happens with the people in the community. And you were talking about this thing and we were like, great, write it up. Let's, let's, let's go. And in between the let's go and, and you know, here's your first check, John and I went back and forth around the proposal, the writing of it. it. Wasn't about the direction that I thought John should be taking. It was about how to make sure that it was articulated in a way that others would understand. So it's that deep respect and enabling that dream to come forward. You bet on people and you bet on big ideas. Hopefully they come from the same person. <laughs> and it did in that case, and certainly with Alana uh, Ruskay Kid as well. That's what I, I think it is. That's how we enter. That's what makes it important. That's what enables me to say, John, how's Jamie, who's seven months old? Um, right? We know about each other. We respect each other. We care about each other. I think it's the same with every other relationship that all of us are involved in. John, do you want to take this from there? Alana, oh, go ahead. It looks like you're about to jump in right in. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. I guess I would say, for also, obviously, I think that trust and respect are a huge piece and a sense of sort of transparency that we don't have to feel like we're pretending or everything is perfect or we got this all worked out. And particularly, I think, and John's nodding a lot, I think particularly as a relatively young organization, but I'm sure it's true in old organizations too, they're bumps. And I think assuming that they're going to be bumps and assuming that a sign of a strong organization is not, oh, we have no bumps, but it's that we can manage them. And no one, we all have experienced over the last 15 months, a very big bump that none of us expected. Um, but I think, again, the, the, the organizations that were able to sort of survive and maybe even flourish um, because of it or in spite of it is, is a piece of it. The other thing I guess I just um, wanted to say is, you know, when you talk, Jonathan, about this sort of transaction and there's somewhat of a negative connotation in it, I think there should be a positive connotation in it. Um, I think that the, the, the giving of that check is holy and it's not dirty and it's not like an aside and it's what like allow dreams to happen. And I would say like, I, I'm very moved both having Joni on the on the phone, on the call here, where we obviously, I, I spent a lot of time with you and Harleen really helping to sort of think about the dream from before it began. And Jonathan, um, when you were in your old, I mean, you know, the story of me and Jonathan is that I met Jonathan before the Chef of School had a name and you're working for a different foundation. And that $50,000 grant that you gave us was probably the, one of the most important gifts that we got mm -hmm. because it, it, it both the money was helpful, but it also putting some stamp of some foundation that thought this was a good idea and that it was someone, then the next person didn't have to put the first dollar in was like tremendous and allowed a dream to flourish. And so, and gave not just me, but hopefully outside people also a sense like, yeah, I believe in this. Someone else should believe in this too. And so I do really think that this transaction should be elevated and we shouldn't necessarily have to feel badly about the fact that we both need the resources and that you guys really, what by providing them, it's, a, it's just a tremendous um, gift. Um, obviously not just to us, but to all them, the users who are able to sort of appreciate the, the idea that becomes um, it goes from an idea into a reality. If I can follow up on that, I, I want to second the transparency notion that you just shared, Alana, uh, and I want to I want to 
deepen a conversation about transparency because I also think it's really important as uh, a young organization, it's easy to follow the resources and morph and change to what's available to you. Uh, and and uh, one of the things that I've really appreciated in the relationships I've had both with the Covenant Foundation and with Lippman Camphor is the transparency around um, really genuinely wanting to know what it is we do and how it is we are trying to do it and the impact we're trying to have through our process, um, but also uh, being fully transparent from the the grantor side, from the foundation side, in terms of what you're interested in um, uh, as a funder and acknowledging that our Venn diagrams might not overlap, mm -hmm. right? But that we're not going to try and morph the circle of our shape on the Venn diagram to create, to force an overlap. But if we're honest and transparent with each other, then um, it's easier to, uh, down the road when there are bumps, down the road when there are new things we learn about how we want to do our work or how we can be more useful, going back to those relationships that started from a transparent place of, of, of uh, being honest about what we're trying to do and what you're trying to support um, just builds a trust that, that makes the relationship stronger when the bumps do occur. I feel like everyone has made any point I would have made in far more articulate words than, than I could have. I, I just love to add a little bit of color to uh, what John just said um, from our particular partnership um, in terms of the, the Venn diagram of the foundation's priorities and the organization's priorities and how trust and honesty and openness really comes from being honest about where we each are in terms of those two places and looking for that overlap and not trying to push either side to get there. And I think one of the most powerful, um, not really a moment because this has been sort of a um, building theme in, in the partnership that we have is um, the way in which that has taken place. And, and the story I wanna share is that um, we ran a prize competition a few years ago called the Libin Camper Prize for Applied Jewish Wisdom. Um, and um, in the process, we were receiving a lot of applications, but we noticed um, that we hadn't received one um, from the Inheritance Project. And there were some, it seemed like it might have been a good candidate. We had no idea if it would have any chance because we weren't even making the, the evaluations. We had a whole team of, of judges, um, but we were curious why they hadn't applied. So I reached out to, to John. Um, and what he told me was that uh, he just wasn't sure that this was you know, the, the right time or the right um, uh, project to be to be applying for. And the the openness and transparency and really taking into account where they were at and where we were at, um, I think was one of those building blocks of, of building that for all of our future conversations. So I just wanna share a very concrete way in which that played out for us. This is why I told everyone not to you know, get your water in advance because you're not going to want to miss a second of this. So this is great. I already have a half a page of notes I've taken here. Um, Alana, you were referencing, you know, sort of the past year or the past year and a half. And I just, you know, obviously we're not out of the woods. We are still very much in this. You run a school. You were just talking before that, you know, this is still very much a live thing. All the things we're going through in this world in the pandemic. Um, but, you know, we know that in the pandemic and then what's been happening the past year and a half that it's required a lot of adaptability, that nonprofit leaders have stretched themselves, that funders have stepped to the plate in a lot of ways. And this has just required a different way of doing business and a different way of being in relationship. And I just wonder if anyone might reflect on, you, you all sort of were setting the ground of just, this is how you wanna do business all the time and in you know earlier years, but kind of right now, if you were thinking about the past year, year and a half, like what's been different in those those relationships for you between you know nonprofits and funders and feel free to reflect on you know a story a lesson something you're kind of holding on to that's felt really kind of meaningful to you John you want to start us off sure uh, um I'll go back to um what we were talking about earlier in terms of bumps in the road right COVID gave us a year where bumps in the road were foreseeable and forgivable by any funder or, or, or grantor uh, in terms of the work that any organization is doing. And I think that that made for um, a, a much more comfortable conversation for me to reach out to the, the funders that we are in partnership with uh, to talk about how we're trying to adapt. Uh, 
And I, what, one thing I would love to remain out of this year is that comfort level of understanding that we're constantly adapting. We're constantly learning things and facing bumps that uh, inspire us to try um, uh, different strategies to get through what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and knowing that that openness to, uh, to process that doesn't go exactly how you expected it to go, I think is, um, uh, would just be such a wonderful thing. And I, 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 in terms of concrete examples, um, uh, I'll say that, you know, I alone, you reached out to me, um, uh, the Inheritance Project was doing a project in Palm Beach. And um, that project, the event in Palm Beach that the Inheritance Project project, the, the project we were doing was created around got canceled. Um, and you reached out to me and said, hey, we weren't funding that project that you were doing in Palm Beach, but I know about it. And we were wondering if you had any sunk costs related to that project that we could be helpful with. And our situation was that we had the funding for the project. And we had these artists we had hired to do the work and we could have paid them what was remaining in the money we had raised to finish the project so they would get what their expected income would be for the months of March and April in 2020. But then we wouldn't have had the money to go back and finish the project, which now we are going to get to do in the spring of 2022. Um, and we would have had to refund raise more resources to do that. And the Lippman Camper Foundation was able to help us uh, um, meet that uh, meet that commitment to the artists that we had already hired to do that work um, while preserving the funding that we had in part from the Covenant Foundation to finish the project in, uh, in the future. Uh, and so that's just a concrete example of the ways in which um, uh, the bumps in the road have been navigated this year. I wanna say one last thing about this year because it wasn't just COVID for the Inheritance Project, especially, um, uh, the uh, awakening around uh, Black lives and uh, the violence against Black lives has really impacted um, uh, the work that we do and the communities that are reaching out to us to do the work that we do. And when something like that happens, there's a change in society that impacts the role your um, or the scale of the role that your organization can play in a society. It can be super frightening uh, as a small nonprofit arts organization. Um, and what hasn't been frightening is all at all is reaching out to Joni and to I alone and and to uh, the the funders with whom we have honest, transparent relationships to say this is what we're navigating and and we would love your help in figuring out how to how to navigate it. Um, I would echo a little bit of what. Sorry, I alone, you can speak. Um, I was going to echo some of what John said. I would say we also were moved. First of all, actually, very much remember the call that you made, Joni, in I don't remember what month, April or whatever it was, to say how are you. And I really appreciated that um, that sort of proactive um, response. And I would say, you know, that there have been funding opportunities. I'd say on two sides. One is like, what do you need? Because like all of a sudden our expenses are different. And certainly as in our, as a school, we had all, you know, all of a sudden I'm buying thermometers and masks and more teachers and all kinds of things that we couldn't have possibly anticipated that are cost. And also on the other side, we've had funding opportunities where people have said like, we want you to be able to maintain the things that you are doing already. And I've appreciated that also of sort of like, don't lose the things that are important, whether it's infrastructure or other pieces. So I really um, and then I guess I would also say sort of giving permission to, to mess up or to say, I'm not, we're, we just can't do this right now. Um, and I would say that the funders have actually often been more forgiving than we have our, of ourselves, of feeling somehow defensive as if we were supposed to be able to continue to have business as usual and dream big dreams while every day, you know, maintaining, you know, COVID testing and all kinds of other pieces. So I've appreciated that that has been the messaging. I guess I would say on the other side and present company not um, excluded has been that there is starting to feel like there's sort of an impatience now of mm -hmm. sort of from not a lot of funders, but there, I'm starting to, you know, hear that also I'm like, okay, now what are you gonna do in September? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you're right. Hopefully in September, things will start to feel normal, but we're still, you know, managing certainly in a school COVID. Um, and so no, there has not been a huge amount of time to kind of imagine life after COVID. And I also don't think it's healthy to rush it because I think there's actually a lot of learnings. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing is, you know, we had a parent book club this week with many more participants than we ever had in the building on a Tuesday evening at seven o'clock because it's on Zoom now, right? So if we quickly start to figure out what, how to go back We've lost 
all, and that's a teeny example, right? But there are millions, and I know every both person and organization is thinking about what did we learn? What were the good things that came out of this year and a half, year and a quarter? And I don't think we want to rush too quickly to come to the answer of what post-COVID looks like um, without giving ourselves ample time to really reflect and appreciate um, what are the parts that we, and, and we're, it's responsive. So it's not just like what the chef at school wants to do. It's that as each one of you all make decisions um, and the world makes decisions about how much they're in the office and how many, a million other things, we're going to have to continue to stay nimble and not to just go back into like, oh, well, let's just go back to where we thought we were before. It's not the right answer. I don't, I don't believe. Yeah. One thing I'll just add to this is like we've seen in the broader world with regard to COVID, that what it's done is brought challenges and opportunities into starker focus, things that were already there beforehand. We've definitely, as a team at the foundation, been trying to see how this has been um, bringing into focus issues that have always been there and try to be more sensitive to them and pay attention to them. So to give a very concrete example, again, uh, one of the things that we've really been paying attention to a lot during COVID is that our partners are incredibly stretched, stretched incredibly thin. They are doing amazing, amazing work um, over time. You know, every everyone at these amazing organizations is is doing um, pulling their their weight and then so much more. And one of the things we've been asking ourselves is how can we support our partners um, in the most helpful way and in the least um, uh, burdensome way where we're not contributing to um, making things harder for them in, so, in some way. And so one of the ways we've been trying to do that um, during COVID um, is to um, minimize during this period the reporting requirements that we've had for, for our grantees. Um, and that's really been part of a larger process that we've been engaged in before COVID started and that we hope to continue after, which is thinking about when we're asking grantees for something, going back to the, the Venn diagrams that we were talking about before, because I think this really touches on everything. When we're asking for something, we want to make sure that it's both helping us achieve the things we need to achieve, but that it's also helping our partners achieve something that they need to achieve. And if it's only in one of those circles, um, that, that should be pause for reflection about how we can do it better. Mm -hmm. I would just add a, a couple of things uh, to this. Um, one, um, during COVID, and Alana alluded to um, the you know the conversation, the outreach. Uh, we did that with all our grantees in April and early May. You know, um, for everybody, and to some of our award recipients and pomegranate prize recipients as well. But primarily, the concern was with our grantees, and it's because we were all like what just happened and we're trying to let people know it's okay it's okay we're we're all in this relax um and what are your priorities or go about your priorities and we'll figure the rest out together don't worry and our, the watchword was or phrase was lead with empathy period lead with empathy that was for our staff and that was for our grantees and listen and try to understand. And for those that really were having a rough patch, pretty much everybody went through something that wasn't so simple. But then there was another layer in some cases where people were doing a lot of direct service. It became really challenging to do it, um, elderly, you know, all this stuff. And so we kept in touch with them much more um, to help them through and orient funds in a different way, additional funds, whatever it kind of took whatever we could do, that's, that's one thing. I, I think that the other thing was, what can we do um, for those within what we might call uh, the covenant family? What can we do for those folks, who, grantees and others, who um, are really all of a sudden incredibly creative during this period? Um, how can we lift them up, not only to be creative, and institute all kinds of new initiatives or whatever it's gonna be, or even tiny things during this period. But who's looking out over the horizon? To Alana's point, um, let's stop and what, what, what's it gonna be? What's it going to look like after that? And there were people who we were engaged with who were coming to us, who were going to, involved in various conversations in various places. And it was, 
what are you thinking about on the horizon? How might what you're doing now play later? Because we're all getting out of this through some portal somehow um, over so many months going forward, even from now. And that was the other thing with opportunity, with, with challenges come opportunities. And we kept our eye on that prize as well. Some of it was for right now, how you're gonna get through the next six months. And some of it was, where are we looking out over the horizon? The empathy sat in how we're getting through the next six months or year. The excitement and the inspiration sat in, what are we looking at over the horizon? And that, that's how I would th I think about this particular period. And, and it's continuing, unfortunately. I think that's so right. And I kind of feel like, I'll just say in terms of this conversation, on what are we learning and the empathy, like there's a real mutuality here, right? Like part of what was revealed in this paper is no one had the answers, right? Like nonprofits are trying to figure it out, funders, we were all trying to figure it out and as much as it might be that, you know, I think there were these really powerful examples of funders reaching out saying, we care about you, we have your back, how do we support you? Frankly, I can think about many times in the past year where I had nonprofit leaders call me saying, we're learning this, we're figuring this out. This is the conversation we're in you need to know this because this is going to help inform your thinking and your planning and your, the things you can do. I needed that. Like I couldn't figure it out just by sitting in my room with a whiteboard with my colleagues. I needed the knowledge that was being generated from you know, leaders in the field. So I, I think we should kind of hold on to that mutuality. And that's something I'm hoping we'll take forward that it doesn't feel like when we sit down together that there's a sense of you know, one player has the knowledge and the other player has the resource or vice versa, but like we're really in it together. Um, just maybe turning the page. Uh, I know when we were talking a few weeks ago, kind of in preparation for this, in different ways, each of you actually reflected in really interesting ways about the concept of time and how time has felt different in this period. And I think we kind of hear that sometimes in a very cliche way where someone goes, I don't know if it's Tuesday or January, but actually like what we meant by that, what I heard in this group was time has, you know, in some ways expanded and refracted and contracted and it's just felt different, not only in terms of like how we operationalize our work and how we feel in our lives, but actually like time in our relationships has felt different. And so I just, you know, I open that to any of you and all of you who want, you know, might want to comment on that, because I thought there was just some real interesting um, observations that you, you had offered and in insights there. So I think one of the ways in which time has really changed during COVID um, is in terms of its relationship to predictability that a big part of our experience of time is that we know or we have an idea of what happens in the next minute and the next hour and the next day and the next week and so on. Um, but COVID has really thrown us for a loop in not knowing. Um, and it's really been a profound humbling in reminding us that as much control as we thought or think we have in life, um, that we actually don't. And so much of, I think, any relationship and any partnership, especially a funder um, grantee partner relationship, um, is really about how to navigate um, the unpredictable. Because the predictable is the stuff that you can plan for beforehand. The, the, the challenging stuff is what happens when things come up that we didn't know about. And this has been a huge reminder that there is so much more of that um, than we often um, take into account. And one, one of the things that I think, again, to try to uh, make it as personal and um, concrete as possible with, uh, with, in terms of our partnership with the Inheritance Project, um, John reached out and was very clear and um, open that um, some of the plans that we had had for the, um, for the projects that we're partnering on just wouldn't be able to happen in the time frame that we had talked about. Um, and what we talked about together was how we can do this in a way and move forward in a way um, that was really honest and supportive of their, their process um, and taking into account the possibility of further unpredictability. Um, and so I think that's a reminder across the board, but it was just something that certainly came up over here. And I don't know, John, if you wanna talk a little bit more to that. Yeah, I, I, thank you for saying that. And, and this goes back to something, Joni, you were uh, saying as well earlier, but um, about the right now and the future. And I, I think I alone, one of the things that um, uh, has been really meaningful about our relationship is that you made a multi-year commitment to the work. And, and I, I just, you know, 
we were talking earlier about what could come out of COVID in terms of our relationships moving forward. I think knowing that we have a long-term, that we are in relationship long-term and not just uh, for this six months or for this one project or for this um, is, um, uh, now the terms of that relationship had to change for us because instead of you know finishing a project in 2020, that project is now finishing this coming June and then the next project will be um, after that inevitably. But, um, but so I just, I, I just wanna make a point that, that uh, it, was, it was really welcoming when you came to us and said that you had flexibility in terms of the timeline of that multi-year commitment that helped us plan um, for knowing that we could plan for the future later allowed us to plan for the right now, right now. Um, and so Joni, back to your, you know, the, the doing both at the same time. Uh, the other thing I just want to name, and I alone, you brought this up at the very beginning, but I think it speaks, Jonathan, to the time question is, um, uh, and uh, Joni is what you said in, about our first conversation. I think we, we moved at the speed of trust, right? That, that, um, when, when I when Joni, when we first met, I had no knowledge or pre-knowledge or any knowledge, nor did it ever come up in our first conversation about a deadline, a grant cycle, uh, or whatever. And I alone, after we um, declined to apply for that prize, which did have a deadline, our first conversation wasn't about a deadline or a grant cycle or whatever, but rather we sat and we talked about what we were you know what we were working on um and we took the time to build the trust that led to um the partnerships so i just want to raise that up as a as a time element that i think could also be a frame for move and if you hear in the background uh jamie the seven month old it's uh it's nap time so i apologize for that i'm happy to say to jump in here i mean i think one of the things about this, these last 16 months, which is which is true about time also. Someone someone used the metaphor that we've all experienced the same storm, but we're in different boats. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that to be a very helpful metaphor in terms of what this last experience has been because we are not all having the same experience. Um, and I would say that certainly being in a school, we have very much felt kind of out of step from most people. You know, I joke that I put on pants and shoes every day. Mm -hmm. Most people do not put on pants and shoes every day. For the last 15 months and that that and certainly in the last spring we were home but you know since the summer we have been planning and we've been kind of in person and the pace has actually been excruciatingly fast um and we're like on a different like we're on super speed we're doing three times as much um and other people are finding like there's much it's much slower and so i think you know, I find that in my personal relationships, I want to be careful not to assume either people had a horrible 15 months or they had a great 15 months. It really depended on a million different factors, stage of life, a million things that that were not necessarily predictable. Um, and I think that's true around organizational life also, uh, depending on what field you were in. You know, schools in some ways were hit really hard. In other ways, we weren't hit hard at all because our business kept operating and no one said, well, do it, does my child need school anymore? Um, which they might have said about lots of other not-for-profit, you know, organizations that are doing wonderful things. But um, so I just think that that appreciation also of just checking in and saying, what has the last 15 months been for you? I think is very important um, in terms of thinking about time. I just have one comment. It's not so much about time, although I totally appreciate the way that uh, John and Alana just described sort of the time of trust and then time, how different people had different experiences over this time. You can't assume anything. I just want to go back to something that both John and Alana said at the very beginning, which is a term I never use, um, but which I totally understand. This idea of bumps in the road right? Understanding bumps in the road. So what I would say there is the bumps in the road are the road, right? They're, they're the dynamism, the beauty and the challenge of the dynamism of our life, on, you know, working in the field, on the ground. And so when, when I think of, and we as the foundation, think about the uh, kind of dynamism on the ground, it feels exciting to us, you know, that's the muck. That's the, oh, let's kind of make a left turn over here. Or, hey, Johnny, 
<laughs> this isn't working at all. <laughs> so let's, you know, figure it out. This is what we're, you know, what we're understanding. So I, I guess I would just, I want you to point it out because I don't, I don't want to think about it as, I don't want to think about it as a bump in the road. I want to think about it as the excitement of the dynamism of what's going on. And that's like, oh, I'm in, <laughs> you know, what, what are you thinking about? Um, so I just kind of wanted to point that out that it's always that way. It is the road, um, you know, anyway, just for the, for the record, for you guys and for anybody else who happens. I love that reframe. That's awesome. We're all going to become mountain bikers. We're all like wanting. To <laughs> <That's be. right. laughs> um, this is great. And I also, I would just say like one thing that um, I'm thinking about is when we talk about the, the idea that something that's happened recently is this idea that we've been more comfortable, I think, on all sides, letting our guard down and being honest. I feel like that accelerated a lot. Like that really, it just felt so much safer earlier in relationships to kind of say, we're not okay, or like, this is where we're challenged. And I'm like, that's the thing I'm hoping will stick around that we, we don't have to say, okay, finally, after four or five years of being in relationship, then we can kind of be really honest with each other, that that transparency could potentially happen faster in a sense that, you know, I'm hoping for, for that. I'm gonna give a signal to um, the folks watching at home that you can, um, you know, begin if you have queuing up questions, which Tamara is gonna be paying attention to. We're gonna get to questions in just a few minutes, but let me um, turn to Joni and to I alone as two people in the call presenting kind of you know, funder or the donor hat. Like when you're thinking specifically about that role, like we know, I know there's challenges in that role in terms of the power dynamics. Like there's challenges in terms of how do you get really great feedback? How do you have a great accountability? And just what are you thinking about differently? You started to talk about some of those things. I and I really appreciate this point about questioning, like is our reporting uh, the right kind of structure? But just generally, as they're thinking about your own role and you, what you might want to do differently or think about differently going forward, how you, how you show up in this work, kind of just open-ended you know, reflections or things that are on your on your mind. Ayelon, you have some immediate thought? Okay. <laughs> I was trying. <laughs> um, um, you know, I, I'd like to go back to what Alana said uh, about um, don't make the transactional like a negative. Um, uh, sure. Could our um, letters of inquiry, well, they're two pages, so it's not a whole lot, but, you know, could our proposals somehow be uh, less, less, could our, um, our uh, reporting uh, twice a year, you know, for the accountability, so to speak, um, uh, be less? I guess so. Um, but, in, you know, that's what I think of in, in terms of, you know, at least the bottom layer of, of this question. I just think the grantee learns a lot when they're asked to really sit and reflect. I think that we learn a lot when we see their reflection. Um, I think we learn a lot when we understand when they're looking out the next six months, if they're really like taking it seriously and thinking about what might change, what might be different, what new idea popped, it's inspiring. Um, it may give them permission to say, okay, they're asking, you know, and so far they haven't been so scary. so let's let's go with it. Uh, so I like that stuff. I mean, I've been on the other end also, you know, I know. <laughs> this isn't really convenient right now. I'd like to do it next month, but <laughs> oh, it's due in two weeks. Um, so I, I get it. But I think that that taking that moment to stop and reflect like we do in our lives is important. To do different, I just hold on to this thing about leading with empathy, leading with inspiration, leading with excitement, leading with openness. I think it became like, oh, oh, the, yes, of course. Why weren't we using this language before? Even if we were doing it, it is just dug in so deep into the psyche of the foundation and to, I know Harleen as well, certainly into my psyche. Like, okay, let's double down on all that. This is real. This is what relationships are about. Um, that's really, you know, it's so basic. It's ridiculous on some level, but I, I just think that's what it is. Um, that, that taking it all in and um, that I, just to build on that maybe a little, um, I think that um, 
one of the things in being in the in the grant making position that we try to pay attention to, um, especially in terms of those power dynamics that you mentioned, Jonathan, is looking for signals. Um, which are sometimes hard to to pick up, especially if if it's it's totally understand why it would be hard for um, grantees to sometimes share them in a more explicit ways. But to try and pick up on signals, often from ourselves, of when those those that power imbalance may be um, off kilter and something may be going in the wrong direction. So, if we find ourselves stepping into a, a dynamic where um, it's turning into a feeling of being more directive, telling an organization what what we what we where we think they should be going, or pushing them to go in that direction. No, that's a signal. It doesn't mean that something is is broken, but it's a signal that we should be reflecting on on why have we gotten to this to this place. Um, and the the same substance of that conversation could look very different if it's coming from a place of. Um, shared interest in exploration and hoping for the same things and just thinking about different ways of going there. Um, and it could look very different if where it's coming from is a place of trying to impose one one vision on, on someone else. Um, and I, the, the way that I think we try to, to navigate that um, is through that openness and, and trust that we've, we've talked about. Um, but also again, by, by trying to be, um, to pay attention to, to, to those dynamics and seeing when um, they've really um, tilted too heavily in one direction. So I guess I'd ask sort of almost the, uh, the flip question to Alana and to John, right? Like when you're thinking about the seats, the seats you're in in this dynamic or this relationship, like what are you thinking about differently? What do you need from funders? I, I've heard both of you say in this conversation that you really get a lot out of these relationships with funders. You're not looking for this to be transactional. You value the wisdom, but also you have a North Star you're going for. You know, you want to avoid, you know, we all want to avoid mission creep. We all want to kind of stay true to our own organizational goals as leaders. So like just what are you what are you thinking about kind of in this moment and what you need, you know, from yourself and from the funders you're in a relationship with? Um I think like as I'm imagining it, like what's my fantasy? It's like big sales. It's like, give us wind, give us room. Like, I think that there has been like a lot of feeling of constraint in all kinds of ways. And I guess, like, I feel like we've all worked really hard over these last years and to, to sort of build a sense of trust. Um, and I think that, that like, things have been messy and I think there are opportunities, which I really appreciate this group has really shared about that mess. And like, not like, how can we kind of harness it, you know, with some big sales and not getting too caught up in um, the map may be a little bit unknown. And I think it's an opportunity to do a little bit of messing about um, and learning from trying that and knowing that we don't know. And like, can we kind of sink into that experience of knowing that we don't know and sort of allowing that to be a place, part of the North Star of it all. Um, and I think that I know that certainly some funders have also really been strapped by trying to save and protect the organizations that they care about and making sure that the status quo has been stable. And I really appreciate that. And I've we've been on that side and at the same time, like wanting to have enough room and space for some of the, as you know, which has also been alluded to the, the new big ideas that, um, that are coming and to make sure that there's not too much constraint in our ability as we go back into those open seas um, to sort of have space to do that. I just wanna say when you said big sales, I heard that first as S-A-L-E-S. And then I realized you meant S-A-I-L-S. And I think that that could sort maybe of be, both. The, maybe <laughs> that could be the motto for the whole normals. We're trying to have like less big sales, more big sales. You know, big sales, big sales. So I, I love that. Um, we've got a couple questions in the chat. Can I, John, go ahead. Jonathan, can I, can I just pop in to give an answer real quick? The, the um, Alana, you were talking about the mess. And I would just say from, from my perspective and our perspective, um, uh, it, it's an honor of, uh, it's, Placing value on process, um, and uh, you know, Joni, you told the story about how the first time I sat with you and Harleen and tried to explain devised theater in this open way that we that we make it, um, where everybody's in the room as it's being made, and that being the process, being the product, and the play is just the gift we give back to the community at the end. Um, but uh, but that's a metaphor for what Alana was just saying. 
right? Um, we're, we're practicing that as artists uh, and community engagers and, and educators, but, um, but as, uh, as an organization, uh, the process is our practice. And, um, and I think that uh, what would be, what has been useful and would continue to be useful is um, a partnership with funders who are invested in the process as much as what comes out of the process at the end, which um, uh, can look like a lot of different things uh, depending on what you're working on. So I just wanted to make that. Thank you, Jonathan, sorry about that. No, no, please, I'm glad you added that in. Um, we've gotten a couple questions and a few different things I'm gonna to try to thread together and, and maybe paraphrase and I hope I'm doing justice to them. But you know, at the beginning of the whole, we're talking about that Venn diagram that you don't wanna really, everyone wants to be authentic. Funders should be authentic about their priorities, nonprofit leaders about their priorities. And hopefully the magic happens when we realize we have, there's some overlap there. But kind of acknowledging that, that there's still challenges, right? Like there's still challenges, even if there, you have that perfect Venn diagram, where not everyone is necessarily in an equal spot in terms of their ability to necessarily gain access or visibility, um, you know, particularly if you're grant seeking to someone who's in a position of giving resources, whether that's an individual donor or a foundation. I think people are kind of asking for some guidance there, like what does that look like to broker that relationship? And I think there's also some acknowledgement I'm seeing in some of the questions of perhaps some of the, the inequities in that, that there can be, you know, depending on where you're located geographically or from a class position or the type of work you're doing, you might not be in, or identity you hold, you might not be in the same, uh, even, you know, let's call it the metaphoric uh, cocktail party to kind of meet people and get that credibility that other people sort of easily can move into. And I'm, I'm happy, Joni and Ilon, for you to answer that, but also, frankly, Alana and John, like both of you in different ways, I think do work that in, I would say historically has been sometimes undervalued and not centered in Jewish life. So you may also have thoughts in terms of what that looks like to kind of call attention to work that is deeply important to our Jewish values, but might not always be the stuff that has historically been front and center in the mind of some donor. So I'm, I'm open to anyone who wants to jump in with some guidance to folks on the line. I, I'll just start by saying, I, I don't know if this is guidance. Um, I want to hold up the question um, and from the grant making side to recognize the, the challenge um, and to own the challenge and say, you know, that's something we um, are striving to address more fully. I, um, I think it's going to take time and effort for us and all, and by us, I mean all grant makers to figure out how um, to do that more, more effectively. But um, I want to um, say, you know, certainly the goal is to try to make sure that um, the most aligned projects, wherever they're coming from, um, are the ones um, that we're seeing, and, and we want that as much as you know, as as much as the grant seekers. We we want to find those those projects that may not be on our radar, and um, the challenges on on both ends. Thanks, Ayla. Um, you know, uh, I think we would all agree, um, and I learned long ago. Uh, from mentors and others that I alluded to when, in my first remarks, um, that uh, part of the job of a philanthropy is, uh, is to be knowledge seekers, right? We're knowledge gatherers. Um, you know, people talk about you 30,000 feet up, you're seeing what's going on. Um, that's a job, that's a job. Um, and it's a, a primary job. The thing that works, I didn't invent it, God knows, it was uh, Jonathan Wupcher. And, um, and, and uh, uh, Judith Ginsburg, the uh, founding director of the Covenant Foundation, um, uh, decided that we would receive uh, letters of inquiry over the transom, anybody, anywhere, doing Jewish education from this end of the continuum to that, from up here to down there, wherever it was, you were welcome to submit. And each one of those, no surprise, obviously, each one of those uh, LOIs is read by staff, read by multiple reviewers, um, back to staff. I mean, you, you've got 15 people looking at each one of these things before, before a decision is made through a whole dynamic process um, who's will be uh, th those that will be requested for full proposal. And then we go through it all over again. So there are still, even with that, even with that, there are still those uh, folks in, in different organizations, uh, you know, Jewish 
organizations that do educational work, Jewish educational, you know, however you want to put that, um, who don't know about us, who don't know a, a, about Libman Camper, who don't know about, um, who are casting about hoping they have a great idea. It's very local. They can't get money locally. You know, you can go on and on. I don't want to bother to do that right now uh, with the time lim limit we have. Um, that it's incumbent upon us not only to gather knowledge to understand what's going on as best we can around the country, but also to find a way to let people know in these local communities, in these small organizations, okay, we're one, we're one foundation among many, but apply, try it. Two pages, a budget and a cover page. It's not a lot. If you have an idea, we have we have mission. We have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not processes, but um, what it needs to be. You know, an innovative something, a, a, a new idea, or, or a new spin on an old idea. That's in a nutshell what it is. So it's incumbent upon us to do two things: get out there and prospect who's doing what, and two, let people know that we exist. And on top of it, gather the knowledge about the best and brightest ideas that are happening around the country in Jewish education. That's really that nexus for us. That's where the inequality comes, comes through. People don't know and they don't have access. That's tough. That's a real tough one. Can I, can I add to that, Joni? Um, just to say that, that um, uh, uh, and I'm really glad we get to answer this question too, Jonathan, because um, I feel an immense responsibility to hold the door open. Uh, and, and as Joni knows, I, I mean, there may be a dozen different artists over the course of the last seven years that we've been in relationship that I have set up with meetings with somebody from the Covenant Foundation because um, I thought they were doing something in the field of Jewish education that might be interesting and worth the Covenant Foundation knowing about. I mean, definitely interesting and worth the Covenant Foundation knowing about. And the other thing that I, uh, and it's not just me, I, I've done this in partnership with some of the other artists that the Covenant Foundation has funded, is that we, we advocated for ourselves to the Covenant Foundation that uh, we needed our own convening. We needed our own community of practice. You know, the Covenant Foundation has this project directors meeting every year for the grantees, most of whom are not working as artists. They're working in other ways of, of professional Jewish education. And uh, we were attending those meetings and, and finding each other in the hallways. And, and, and to your credit, Joni, y'all made space for us. Um, uh, and you, every time I've introduced somebody to, to you or Harleen or, or Arya, anybody at the foundation, somebody has met with them. Um, and, um, but it's incumbent upon grantees, I think, also to hold the door open. And uh, once we get access to share that access with, with other folks who are, who are also doing really compelling work, because um, there's just not enough of us who are, who are uh, supported and funded. I, I appreciate that. I don't have, I don't want to add other than to say thank you. Yes, yes, grantees are, are absolutely front and center in being able to have that happen. So that, that's great, John. I guess I would just also say, like as a grantee, um, you know, I think that people, you know, my grandfather used to say everyone's in sales, sales, S-A-L-E-S. -E um, and I think that like kind of coming to accept that is not so easy. You know, you think you're going in to be an artist, to be an educator. And and the truth is, first of all, as an artist or an educator, you're also selling something. You're selling something to your audience. You're selling something to your students. But I think that sort of coming to accept that part of the work is is selling it. Um, and that that and that when you say selling it, though, again, that just like a transaction isn't a dirty word, that this isn't a dirty word and that it requires also an education. And absolutely, like certainly it sounds like your experience with with Jody and Harling was like you tried to explain what you do. And certainly, you know, I've many times had to start by saying, let me back up. Let me tell you about kids with learning disabilities. Let me tell you what that looks like. Let me tell you what it looks like when they're in a school where they're not well met, well served um, and that that does require time and it's it's actually holy work and they may or may not at the end of the day be interested ultimately in funding it but if nothing else like your your cause is much bigger than just getting a check your cause is also that their mind is 
is expanded and it may affect the next the next choice that they make or the next person that they meet. Um, and just to sort of, you have to a little bit reframe what you think your job is um, and to sort of not just accept it, but even perhaps love it because it becomes a part of how you then are able to do the work that you do. And I think that, you know, the more funders are open to having those conversations, I think it is true that I can, I both appreciate sometimes when funders say, you're not what we're interested in. Um, and, and it's like, you know, much as it's disappointing, in some ways it's helpful to be able to be clear. And sometimes to think about when is it on that margin that it's worth the conversation because you never know. And you may be that person who writes a $50,000 check to a school that doesn't have a name. And, um, you know, seven years later, we're in a very different position. So I think it's, it's, that's a balance for all of us. Um, I think that's right. And I'm so glad that John and Alon are sort of offering this idea that you can help hold the door, or send the elevator back down for someone else. And I also think funders can do that, that we're not always in the position of being able to support everything. But our ability, Joni, kind of describing us being talent scouts means we need to know what other funders are interested in that we might also help with some of that kind of referral and door opening process. So we're really kind of just now, like the time is flying, we're basically closed out on time. And I just want to give everyone here, the four of you, a chance to offer any final words as you're thinking about the future, what's exciting, what's challenging, or just something you're kind of holding on to from this conversation as a closing thought or idea that you want to you wanna help us end, end on. I don't know. I'll, I'll start. Uh, just, I love the conversation. I love being in conversation with Ayala and Alana and John and to meet you, Jonathan. Um, known about the Clarman Foundation for a very long time from my friends at Facing History. So uh, yeah, so it's been a long road uh, with them, with you, uh, which gives me pleasure to reflect on. Uh, I would just say, you know, this has been a really emotional time these last 14, 15 months. It's, it's been rough, whether you went through it easily or you didn't. Um, the world kind of fell apart and um, we all derive strength from our friends, our colleagues, our family uh, to keep going. And I've been very lucky not to have been affected virtually at all um, in terms of my health and the health of my family, but it's been an emotional time. And so it heightened emotion. It, it heightened what's important if you can hold on to it. And sometimes it's hard day to day to day. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm sure you can all agree. Um, but it's what, I, it's what I sort of said earlier, just holding on to the respect, the empathy, the relationship, the power of it. Um, you know, it, th that's what sustains us all, whether it's personally or professionally. And that's what matters. Yeah, it's all the other stuff. We're knowledge gatherers. We're all smart. We're all whatever you started with, Jonathan, you know, <laughs> this thing. Um, yeah, yeah, we're all smart. We're all creative. We're all something else. We're whatever it is, you know, great. Um, but, but in the bottom line, honestly, it's nothing more than the relationships. And that's what I'm holding tightly to. It's what gives me the oomph to get up in the morning. Um, that's why I love the work. Got lucky, really privileged, really privileged. Um, that's that's all I really, yeah, that's what I'd like to say to close out. Who wants to go? Ayelan, go ahead. Uh, sure, I'll, just, uh, I'll just say, uh, first of all, really grateful, uh, Jonathan, for hosting this and um, or uh, facilitating this and Tamar and JFN for hosting it. And really to, to Joni, Ilana and John for such a, a rich conversation. And I'll say what uh, leaves me where I'm, what I'm feeling now is um, this sort of feeling energized and excited about the fact that we're, I and we are part of a community that is so dedicated to doing this work as well as we can. And it doesn't mean we always do, but that we're so committed to doing it as well as we can, that we want to have these conversations. We want to learn from each other. Um, and we're really, we're striving for, for something great. And um, that, that commitment, I find really exciting and empowering, especially um, when we go through challenging times. Yeah, I guess I would say that, that this process has been helpful. I think that we as a society are so quickly often right now in sort of two sides. Everyone goes to their camp on almost any issue right now, which is just depressing and, and difficult. And I think this was helpful for me, certainly. In, and, and I think that, you know, you obviously, that was the point of this thing was that the sort of funders and grantees can also see themselves as sort of in two camps. Um, and so it's just, 
it's very comforting and, and I appreciate being reminded once again that we are not in two camps. We are very much on the same, in the same camp doing, trying to do the same um, good work. And, um, and, and, and I think we've seen, I think we've seen a lot of the strengths of these, the relationships and what is possible, what gets unearthed um, in difficult times and um, the sort of tremendous beauty that, that I think has been exposed. And I'll, I'll just say, uh, pulling from everything wise, all the wise things that, that my three friends just shared is that, um, you know what, the last 15 months happened to everybody. And uh, it doesn't matter what side of what conversation you're on, you all experienced the last 15 months. Uh, uh, you know, we were all in the storm together, as, as Alana said, and, and um, uh, I I've been thinking a lot about the fact, and 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 uh, we've been talking as as a team in our organization about the fact that we feel like this is a, this is a moment when we can be a part of a global conversation, a human conversation. Uh, you know that we cannot accomplish the work of Tikkun Olam if we are only doing the work of Tikkun Shtetl. Um, and uh, uh, and so I, you know, uh, it, it and you can't do that work alone. You can't do any of this work alone. So. Um, so I, I'm feeling really uh, energized and comforted by the uh, the friendships and partnerships um, that help make the work happen. Thank you all. And we've got Tamara to close us out. I just want to express so much gratitude to the four of you for the just the humanity and the dignity of this conversation. And regardless of any hats we wear or chairs we're sitting at, like we're all human beings in this work. And I just really feel that in this. So I'm I'm so appreciative of, of that. And the, and the I think we said at the beginning what we were striving for is authenticity. And I really felt like we we achieved that here. So thank you. Uh, Tamar, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And thank you, Joni, Alana, I alone, and John Adam. What a beautiful conversation, what an energizing conversation. Jonathan, you were right, get it. I filled a few pages worth of notes. I have so many pearls of wisdom and snippets that I'm taking from today. And I'm sure everybody on the line is taking that as well. So thank you all for, for, your, for your honesty and openness. And thank you everybody for joining us. And please join us again at future granted programs. Our next one is Wednesday, June 16th from 12 to 1 um, Eastern time. Um, we are going to be talking about a new self-assessment tool that granted worked with Exponent Philanthropy to rejigger for the Jewish community to create the best relationships that you possibly can, you can have and improve your relationships. So please look at our jgranted.org website to sign up for that and to see all the other resources. Um, so thank you all again and have a wonderful day.